the equivalence relation to the quotient, right? And that gives rise to the, I mean, there's this deep work in algebraic geometry which says that if you think of the, the, uh, the space of matrices in terms of the, I mean, the, the Jordan form as uh, a semi-simple part and, and the nilpotent part, then you have to throw away the nilpotent part if you want to get a nice algebraic variety on the quotient. Uh, and so there was a generalization of this idea where you have, say, a simple linear system, x dot of t equals a matrix x of t plus b, another matrix u of t. Here the the, the the group action is similarity transformation on the left, on the x's, similarity transformation on the right, and also feedback. And so the, you could ask a similar question. What is the, is the equivalence, right, relation on the space now Rn squared plus Nn? Can that, can one transport that quotient or not? And then there was a lot of work. And so there was also the work on parameterization and the question of parameterization and things like canonical form. Uh, and what I find uh, curious because of possibly my ignorance, I mean, what are the analogous questions of statistics today? especially in high dimensional statistics. I mean, why isn't the issue of parametrization doesn't seem to be of concern. And I know many problems where you certainly have to do the statistics on the orbit space, or you would have to do estimation on the orbit space, etc. Uh, why are those structural questions not being asked? And going back to Greg, talk and also uh, the talk, that this whole business of choice of metric, I think you, you do model reduction or canonical correlations or, or, or SVD and or think of linear, take CRR's book and look at linear statistical inference and what are the corresponding questions for high dimension. So, so that's one set of questions which I'm suggesting should be addressed. And the, the second set of question is, well, what about the role of information? Uh, I mean, how should, what role, so in, you saw in Greg's role, there's a clear role of, of information theory there. What are the analogous questions, information-like questions, say, in, estimation of one kind or another, so I'll talk about that. Uh, so I had a section on, on canonical, uh, canonical correlation, the principal component analysis, well, we really know everything about that now, so I don't have to say it. So I want to give a simple example, uh, which is related to what, uh, Everett was talking about that how do you now get the notion of distance from the algorithmic side? Uh, so let's see. Okay, so more or less what I've said in words is kind of written down there. And then I'll, this is the principal component analysis. I'll skip that, and the point I'm going to try to make is that So to examine the role of principal component analysis in classification clustering, I mean, the point I'm making is that, for example, the principal component analysis somehow has to be related to the task at hand. So here's an example, you have, uh, Right, two covariance matrices with these parameters, and notice that the 
it's the x1 coordinate where there are the one sitting there. And then there is sort of the orthogonal complement, the, the 0 0.9000.1. 0 0 0 now, suppose we want to reduce the dimension of the data using principal component analysis for solving the, the, the problem as classification. Well, what you, in, so in the terminology of PCA, the first principal direction is the X1 direction. But this direction has little effect if our task is to discriminate between the two classes. Because what you would do is you would take convex combination of those and then do principal component analysis. But the information as far as classification concerned is really in the orthogonal complement. So what this is saying that as far as the task is concerned, the L2 metric is not the right metric. So the interesting question is how do you, how will you get at the notion of, the correct notion of distance or topology? Uh, or even concretely, how do, would you determine, how would you generate the right directions which are informative for the task at hand? So in some sense, the, the principal components may well be a, a universal uh, feature space in some sense, but one has to be careful. I mean, that's, that's the point I make. Okay, the, the second example is that, uh, is what I've drawn up here. There's a embarrassing misprint is think of G of T as some kind of a signal. And H1 of T and H2 of T are sort of noisy observations of G of T. Now, if you ask the question, so given G of T is the observation and you have to choose H1 of T or H2 of T as near to each other. If you look at the L2 distance, then you would say that H1 of T is near to G of T. I mean, LP is the equivalent classes. On the other hand, if you, for example, in pattern recognition, certainly H2 to of C seems to be near H G of T. So that, that arises because of the nature of the uncertainty, whether the uncertainty is, is in the amplitude noise or the, or the uncertainty in, in the noise itself. Now you can do some analysis and say the, the correct metric here is the, this Korokod metric on the space of a you know, Cadillac processor, for example. And that gives you the right sort of phenomenologically correct uh, detection pr procedure as H2 being near to H1 of T. So it seems to me that, uh, I mean, I, I'm, I'm not sure if, if, if other notions of principal components exist. For example, maybe measure distances in terms of relative entropy. Uh, so you can certainly compute the relative entropy between Gaussian processes, stationary Gaussian processes. But in, anyway, I, I mean, I'm pointing out that the, the issue of the choice of metric, the issue of choice of topology is an important problem, I think, in classification. And we have, we have to pay attention to that. Okay. Well, uh, I did compute the, the relative entropy between stationary stochastic process. So that's possible. But if you want to do model reduction using relative entropy, and that seems to be a non-convex, highly non-convex problem. So that relationship to maximum life. Okay, so that's one part of my talk. Now, 
So this is what I've mentioned about this whole issue of going to canonical forms and uh, understanding the, 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 the structure of the linear systems under the action of group action set. And uh, what are the corresponding roles in, in for example, the high dimensional physics? Okay. Yeah, so this is a similar problem. I think it's still open. But given a covariance matrix, possibly semi definite, you've got to decompose into a. So, so that's an n by n matrix. So that's the, the decomposition into rank matrices, rank deficient matrices going from 1 to n minus 1 plus noise. So you may want to uh, assume in some cases n as a diagonal matrix. But anyway, a, think, think of this as a decomposition into a signal plus noise. Then what is the structure of all such rank decomposition? I think that problem is more or less open. Worth looking. So this I have already. I know. I've just written down the the scoropod method here, which allows you to distinguish between, make precise this whole idea of the nearness of one function. Okay. So now I'm going to. Talk about uh, the uh, whole lot of stuff that is going on at the moment, uh, namely understanding stochastic gradients, for example. And this is related to Ali's talk. And how would speed up things like stochastic gradients? And how would you analyze the questions of both convergence and rates of convergence? of stochastic gradient light algorithm. And uh, is there, and problems of estimation, this is all in continuous time because formulas are better in continuous time rather than discrete. Uh, what is the, the information theoretic view of estimation problem? Namely, what one would like to understand is, is how does information flow proceed from the space of observation, say, into the space of conditional distribution? And what is the nature of this information flow? For example, is it in some sense dissipated or is it conservative? And I don't know how to answer those questions in general, but in the context of nonlinear filtering, uh, there is a very beautiful answer. Uh, and right, this also relates. We have at least two notions of information in in statistics and information theory. One is, of course, Shannon's information theory and the idea of mutual information. And then there is the Fisher information. So, what is the relationship between Fisher information and uh, Shannon information? So, we can give an answer to questions of this kind. Okay, so this part is technical. So what I'm suggesting is that Bayesian, infer Bayesian inference viewed as free energy minimization is a canonical way of looking at estimation. And then you can ask all sort of questions, you know, what are the empirical versions of that or questions of approximation. So this is abstract, but after Deborah's talk, I feel quite free to uh, use it. So the picture is the following. You have a probability space, and you have 
two random variables x and y. Uh, I also use Borel space. Uh, and x and y are have we have, joint, we have a joint distribution P of X, Y, and marginal P, X, and P, Y. And there exists a reference measure on the space Y, because I may want to change measure. Uh, I have to do that. Such that P, X, Y is, has density with respect to P, X, P, Y, lambda Y. And then to look at the right the so we have P of X Y absolutely continuous with respect to P of X lambda. So I can look at a rather negative derivative Q and I denote by H of X Y is equal to minus log of Q of X Y if y belongs to this set of y tilde space and zero otherwise. So this is nothing else. So q is like a likelihood, of course. And so this is minus log of likelihood. And that's like an energy function. And then we can write down the joint distribution of rex given y over the set A. In, in, in the form of a Gibbs distribution. In, in, sense, in some sense, I've done nothing. But in the other sense, that's an important step. Uh, because once I know I've written down P of x, y, a, y as a Gibbs distribution, it's natural to think that it corresponds to a free energy minimization associated with the collision. OK. And this, the, the top one just says it's a regular conditional distribution. So what this is, right, so this is a y by y conditional distribution. All right. Now, right, P of X. So you don't want to fix necessarily the prior distribution at this point. Um, so P X tilde is, is some other probability measure. And I've just written down the relative entropy between the two probability measures. Two so you have a space of probability measures on X and Px tilde and well, Px whatever is the right uh, just the relative entropy. And what I of H tilde is really the logarithm of the moment generating function corresponding to H tilde. And this notation, bracket notation, is just the expectation. So there'll be expectation with respect to several probabilities. Okay, this is well known. It just writes down what the interpretation of relative metric, uh, relative entropy is. Namely, it's the measure of surprise of Px tilde over Px tilde. Right. Okay. So we have these two probability measures, Px tilde and, and the Px and Px tilde. This just interprets what the likelihood really is. It's really the x conditional inter, inter, information, respectively, the information in the observation itself. 
Now, you may think I've, I mean, I will end up uh, rewriting, but the rewriting has uh, severe consequences. Okay, here is, 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 is the, the main theorem. Uh, I mean, those of you who are, that are familiar with the work of uh, Donska Varadhan, this is a special case of the Donska Varadhan variational formulation. So it's, it's not the. Uh, It's the interpretation that is more important than the, than the, than the proof, in some sense. What it says is, right, that you look at the relative entropy between Px tilde and Px, and the average log likelihood function, that's what H is y is. And what this says is that the, uh, the matching between the prior information and the information that is left over in the log likelihood function is optimal. I mean, Px tilde normally, if it if it's not Px, then it then it has some extraneous information which which he uses, right? And the optimality says is that you should exactly use the if you like the conditional distribution. And average, it's expectation with respect to Px tilde. H is the likelihood, really, right? Yeah, so. My, my goal about 15 years ago was to take the book of Georgi and work out as much as possible that's in the book, sort of modified to information theory. For example, what is the analog of the Gibbs variational principle is somehow the noisy channel coding theorem. And indeed, the noisy channel we gave a proof of special, for special channels of the noisy channel coding theorem as a as a problem in uh, like the Gibbs variational principle, but the Gibbs variational principle gives a characterization of of, of translation invariant right measures, uh, but in, in many of our problems you don't have translation invariant measures. But you have to use the sort of definite the exchangeability ideas and so on. But anyway, the the point is that the conditional distribution of x and y is the unique minimizer of this relative entry term and average log likelihood term. And some of you will recognize that this variation has as a the dual problem, and and that characterizes the optimal conditional distribution to the prior, right? That's the information you gained with respect to y. As, right, in, in, the, in the original problem, the information is the prior distribution and the likelihood, and you get the conditional distribution. And the dual problem says, what are all possible sort of likelihoods which are consistent with the conditional distribution in x, right? All possible channels, if you like. Now, this expression of the relative entropy plus average energy, average likelihood, or average, think of it as energy, that's exactly free energy. And what I'm suggesting is just as to prove the Gibbs variational principle, you have to, uh, you know, take finite volume limits and cost to the limit, I mean, you can now, this free, this variational characterization and free energy minimization 
allows you to do those things that are similar to it in an information theory. By the way, this is sort of more general, like things like maximum entropy. I mean, this will reduce to maximum entropy if the, the probability measure of y is sort of non-singular. Okay. Well, here there is a interpretation of the conceptualization of what the variational formula is saying. Uh, and more or less, you know, more or less, I said in words what, what that means. This just shows that if how the, the variation formula reduces to maximum entropy in this case. Okay, so now, right, as, as I mentioned in, in, in about Vapnik's work, so you have two sequences, X and Y, and you're interested in understanding computing, understanding, in some invariant fashion, the conditional distribution of the X sequence given the Y sequence. Okay. So I'm going to look at the continuous version of that because ultimately I won't have time to do that. I would, I would like to suggest that these ideas and the equations that it arises has implications to understanding things like stochastic gradient. Okay, so the, here the X sequence is some Markov process described by some stochastic dynamical system fed by white noise. That's the way it should look at it. And Y is some noisy observation of, right, of, of X, the Markov process, with additive noise, white noise. Okay, skip this. All right, so what 